Jesus of himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus himself said in John 8 and verse 24 to the Jews who should have from the law of Moses recognized their Messiah, but they didn't. Except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. When you think of the importance of that, you know it's the beginning point of a person who would be saved by Jesus Christ. But we also recognize there is no one single solitary thing that saves us. The Bible, all by itself, does not save us. The love of God, standing alone, does not save us. Belief in Christ alone does not save us. And so on. Each has its place in our salvation. Now, why do I begin with the idea of Jesus Christ being our Savior? Because our faith is in Him. Now, that faith is formed by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. The Word of God can form that trust or faith or belief in Christ because it contains evidence that proves that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Now, without the hearing then of the Word of God, there can be no faith. Yet faith is demanded in us toward God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him for he that cometh to God must look at the obligation the imperative must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him thus now we go back to Jesus' statement to the Jews except you believe that I am he you shall die in your sins Jesus is God in the flesh John 1 1 and 2 and verse 14 he made it clear that he is the Savior. Now today, and for a long time, there have been those, especially in the denominations round about us, who have tried to say, well, Jesus, yes, the church, no, or Jesus, yes, the man, but not the plan. Well, let me boldly affirm from the scriptures that the man Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only Savior of the world, cannot save you without His plan. You know of Christ because of the Word of God, and it's the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. You know what you know about Christ from the Word of God. Thus, you should be able, all of us, to accept what it teaches as to how the man saves us through the plan. Now, the singular plan of salvation, then, is revealed in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. And it's composed of more than one part. Now, I've mentioned faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. And I've emphasized hearing the word, understanding it, and faith being formed in one, faith in Christ as the Son of God. There's where people tend to stop. But the Bible doesn't stop there. You know, a lot of times people stop short of what the Bible has to say. Now, I mentioned that it's composed of several component parts. That is, the plan that the man has whereby we're saved. Each part is logically placed and connected to the other parts comprising God's one singular plan to save man from sin. Now in this particular sermon, I want to deal with the fourth component part in the plan of salvation. Namely, 
one's confession of belief or faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. I've already emphasized to you what Jesus himself emphasized that the inspired John recorded concerning his statement to the Jews, except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. But I learned too from Romans 10 <clears throat> and verse 10 that it is with the mouth that confession is made unto salvation. And then when you find Paul writing to the young preacher Timothy, he says in 1 Timothy 6, and verse 12, beginning, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art called, now watch it, and hast professed a good profession before witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth or makes alive all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. So hearing the gospel of Christ, remember it's God's only power to save anyone, Romans 1.16. And it is to be preached to every creature, Mark 16.15. So hearing the gospel of Christ... Believing the gospel or glad tidings or good news of Christ as it's presented in the word of Christ. And repenting of our sins, Acts 17, 30. All must transpire within a person before one is qualified before God to confess one's faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. I add verse 9 to Romans 10. Thus Romans 10, 9 and 10 and then, of course, verse 17. And the command of Paul to those on Mars Hill in Acts 17.30 to repent. Having accomplished this confession of faith in Christ, one is then, and only then, authorized by the New Testament of the Christ to take the final step in becoming saved from sin. Specifically, being baptized or immersed in water by the authority of Jesus Christ into the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit for the remission or forgiveness of sins. Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, chapter 22, 16, Romans 6, 3 and 4, and Colossians 2, 12. Specifically, baptized into Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 27. Buried with him in baptism, Colossians 2.12. Knowing that baptism doth also now save us, as the inspired Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3.21. Now, a person could rise up and say, just baptize me in the water. Well, why? Do you believe in Christ? I don't even know who he is. Now, what good would it do to dunk somebody in the water when he doesn't even know who Christ is? Have you repented of your sins? I don't know what sin is. I don't know what repentance is. You're going to baptize that kind of person? Well, of course not. So there's a lot more in the simple plan of salvation that transpires within the inward man of a person in each step in that plan than sometimes we realize. It may take quite a bit of study with some people to understand God exists, that Jesus Christ is deity, that he's the son of God, that the Bible is the very word of God. And then to understand the right division of the word, which one must if they're to study it properly, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. It might take some time to get a grip on things, as we want to say, when it comes to being brought to Jesus Christ and to his plan whereby men are saved. And only whereby men are saved from their sins. So it may take longer with some than others. Because one must be baptized based upon his knowledge of the truth. In John 8, 31 and 32. Notice how it's all summed up. Very common passage to all of us. If ye continue in my words. Then are ye my disciples. Indeed. And... Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. 
You're not going to know that truth unless you continue to study his word. Unless you rightly divide or handle right the word of truth. It's just an impossibility. Thus, you'll never be brought to proper belief in God or the Christ through uh, the proper knowledge of the Word of God because you won't have that proper knowledge. And you'll never understand that after one has believed in Christ that he must obey the command to repent of one's sins. You'll never know that it takes sorrow toward God for our sins against God to move us to repent or to break down our old stubborn will, which is the seed of all sin and rebellion against God and every one of us. But when we've done that, it'll be seen in our lives where we're changed the way we live. We'll be interested then above all things in living like the Lord teaches. That's the resolve of repentance. Now we're ready to make the good confession. He says a lot takes place in the conversion process within a person. and takes longer for sometimes that to happen than others. So it's always bothered me since I've been preaching for a long time now. When I see people say, well, well, we'll believe, repent, confess, be baptized. That's all you got to do. And never give a proper study to each step in the plan of salvation and the impact it has on you and the way you're going to live. And the same thing's true regarding confessing one's faith in Jesus Christ. Because unless you confess your faith in Christ, you're not qualified to be baptized for the remission of sins. Yet the confession of one's faith is the obvious way that one proves or at least shows that he believes that Christ is the Son of God. In our country, because of the freedom of religion, to stand up before people and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God has never been any big thing to do. Try it in Christ's day. And as this nation moves the way it's moving, there are some places right now that if you stood in a group of people and said, I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you may have to run. You may have to dodge. We are entering a situation in this country that it's never known since its beginning. And there's no use playing like we're living in 1955. We are not. The whole culture's changing. The whole society's changing. And if we're going to act like we're still going to deal with things as they were 50 or 60 years ago, we're going to be sadly disappointed the very things that we could take for granted, and maybe we never should have, such as moral principles, are being challenged on every hand. So we not only have the problem of the restoration of New Testament, primitive, pure New Testament Christianity through a proper return to the Bible and to deal with denominational false doctrine, but now we have to deal with all these other matters, the existence of God, the proof of it, the deity of Christ. We've all, it's always been there, but it hasn't been as predominant in this country that there is no God and deity, Jesus is not deity. The Bible is not the word of God. Because we're having shoved down our throat today multiculturalism. And you know what that means? Let everybody do his own thing and you keep quiet about it. Well, there's that day fastly coming upon us when to stand up and say, I am a Christian. I am of Christ. I wear his name. I confess Christ to be the Son of God. May bring a great deal of hardship on us. The church may be going to be tried a lot more than we ever thought it would, especially you younger folks and what you face in the future. And already the church is weak as water when it comes to standing up for much of anything. Too many people as individual Christians just can't stand by themselves like Noah did, you might say, or like David did against Goliath and so on down the line. I wonder why they're in the Old Testament seeing it was written aforetime for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope, Romans 15, 4. There may be times when like Shadrach, Meshach, and bed to go. We have to take the stand when nobody else will. Or Daniel, when he was thrown in the lion's den. Is your faith in God, based upon a thus saith the Lord proposition, strong enough to do that? We have confessed, if we are Christians, that we believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And upon that profession of faith, we've been baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. How will it go in our day-to-day -day life? The confession of Christ as the Son of God then is imperative. 
the proofs done by Christ, showing he's the Son of God, were to create belief, John 30 and 31. We've noticed already two or three times Romans 10, 9, and 10 as to confessing with the mouth. And we see in the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 37 that he confessed that Christ was the Son of God. Notice that it is, a, it is a statement made from the inward man, from the heart. When you read Romans 6, 17, and 18, he talks about them being obedient from the heart. That means your whole inward man, your will, your intellect, and rational powers, your emotions, and your conscience are all involved in believing in Christ Jesus. And we must be able then to have that kind of attitude before we're qualified before God to be baptized. You know, when we see people being immersed in water, we can't know all that's in their heart is to their proper understanding of the truth. And remember, it's the Lord who does, and he's the one that does the adding. Acts 2.47. That is adding to the church. It should be noted that one does not confess in to Christ. In to Christ, one does not confess. The same is also true of belief in Christ. And repentance. We must understand that confession is made not into, but unto Romans 10 and 10. Now the word unto means in order to a given end. So one's confession of Christ is set out in the verses we've noticed. is a necessary step, and I specifically have in mind Romans 10 and 10. A necessary step toward our forgiveness of sins or our salvation from sin. But notice, it is not this action that is the step into the saved state or into Christ. Paul makes that clear by inspiration of the Holy Spirit in writing part of the New Testament. When he wrote to the Galatians who had all obeyed the gospel and had been baptized into Christ, when he said it's by their faith that they're baptized, I-N-T-O, into Christ. Galatians, I'll say again, 27. Everything else was headed toward, but it's baptism that is into. That ought to be understood. You see how simple these things are, and you see how big little words are. The meanings that are there. So when I'm studying my Bible to learn the plan of salvation... I started toward salvation. When I study it well enough to understand it and the evidence therein proves that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, I'm headed toward a given end, salvation. Not there yet. And the same is true in repenting of my sins. The same is true in our lesson now in confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But all of those are qualifying steps, the last one being the confession of faith. And having done that, I am now scripturally qualified to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of our sins. Before that, I am not qualified. After each one of the component parts I listed have been done by me properly from the heart, I am now, before God, qualified to be immersed in water for the remission of sins by the authority of Christ. Romans 10.10 10 precisely states that the confession unto salvation is with the mouth. Now, some people say, well, what if the person can't talk? Why well, if he doesn't have a tongue of vocal cords? Well, it's the normal way that we speak, and that's what he's using here. There's other ways we can indicate that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You can do it by hand signals. I can ask you, do you believe with all your heart Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Shake or nod. And if you shake your head, you know what that means. So it just simply takes a common way that all of us, under normal circumstances, communicate the mouth and the tongue and the vocal cords, etc. But it's not saying that's exclusively it. If you can't speak, you can't be saved. That may seem frivolous, but I've seen folks come up with just such thoughts as that and a wrong division of the Word of God. In Matthew 10, 32, we have, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before also before my Father which is in heaven. 
Now, I want us to look at this for a moment, and I want us to zero in on the word men. M-E-N, men. Men, in this verse, is used to emphasize class and plurality. Or rather, not plurality, but class. Now, it can at times mean plurality. You men of the congregation here, let's do thus and so. But when it says men in this case, it's meaning class. So this is an important point for this reason. And again, if you live long enough, I guess you can hear most error that people teach if you're trying to teach the truth and know what errors around you. But I know of a preacher who taught some years ago that this meant you could not scripturally confess Christ unless you had two or more people present. That's the reason I said that men in this verse is used to emphasize class and not plurality. This is routinely done in the scriptures. It's not teaching that a believing, penitent candidate for baptism must confess his or her faith in Christ before two or more persons before they can undergo scriptural baptism. Now, to show that, let's notice the following scriptures where such uh, use of men as a class is found. You'll remember that when Jesus announced to the disciples the difficulty of wealthy men entering the kingdom of heaven, the disciples asked this, Who then can be saved? And Jesus answered that question. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Now, did you catch it? With men, this is impossible. Well, our Lord is not saying that a plurality of men cannot do what one man can do. So by the use of the word men in this passage, Jesus is saying that mankind cannot accomplish the salvation it needs, salvation from sin. But deity can, Matthew 19, 23 through 26. So we learn from this passage that in this case, the human class cannot do what the divine class can do. Another example. When Jesus put the chief priests and the elders on the horns of a dilemma, he did so by questioning them. He simply asked the baptism of John. Whence was it? From heaven or from men? Matthew 21, 25. Again, the use of the word men in this question simply means mankind. Thus, a certain class. John's baptism wasn't from man. It was from the divine class. It was from deity, not of human origin. But another example. When Peter and the other apostles declared to the Jewish council, we ought to obey God rather than men. Where's the emphasis? The emphasis is on class and not plurality, Acts 5.29. But another one. When Paul told Timothy that there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. Well, what's he doing? Well, he's simply pointing out and emphasizing that humankind has access to deity And now we're back where we started this lesson. Only through Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2, 5. And I say as we start back at the beginning, John 14, 6. Now, I won't continue to labor the point on men used, in the end, as a class. But more examples of men being used to mean mankind could be offered, and you can do that in your own study of the Bible, and you ought to study it that close to see how words are used. And notice we, we're looking at what we would call little words, and yet look how they can be misunderstood 
and misapplied and miss the whole point. I think these then are sufficient for the honest, rational person to understand the real meaning of Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. It has nothing to do with two or more people being present when you confess your faith in Christ so you can be scripturally baptized. It has to do with the class and not numbers of people. I don't know where people come up with some things. As I've said many times, it's a lot easier to understand the Bible than it is to understand how men's fermented minds can come up with such far out stuff. But they seemingly regularly do it. And I, I know from my own study of the Bible the origin of all of it. Our adversary, the devil, who goeth about as a roaring lion, seeking, that's a diligent search of patient inquiry, Seeking whom he may devour. And sometimes there's a whole carcass thrown out here with poison in it and everybody jumps on it and eats it. And other times it's just the minute little bit of speck that they grab hold of. But it's poison enough to kill them. You know, Paul talked a lot to Timothy about being concerned about doctrine. John brought out plainly in his second epistle that if somebody brings another doctrine, don't believe it. Don't bid them God's speed. Don't even invite them into your house. When you read the first chapter of Galatians where people were running after Judaizing teachers, Paul made it very clear that if you're believing a gospel other than the one I preach to you, he says the person bringing that doctrine that's false, let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. Let him be cut off. Now, that's serious business when we teach matters contrary to the truth. That's God's attitude about the matter. And I don't want to hold any attitude about a certain matter other than the attitude God has and is revealed in his mind for me to read. Paul told the Ephesians, when you read what I wrote, you'll know my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. Now, one reason that we don't know what we ought to know is we just don't read. And we don't think about what we read. And we don't learn how to read. And we don't look up words. Words have meanings. And the words God gave us have meanings that pertain to our salvation. In reality, the confession, o malageo, means to declare freely and openly with the mouth what is one's deep conviction. Deep conviction. Thus, the word is employed then in the passage we refer to numerous times. Romans 10, 9 and 10. The confession of Christ is what certain ones among the chief rulers would not do. Why? They didn't have deep conviction, John 12, 42. Matthew 10, 32 carries the same root idea as Romans 10, 17. But it also contains the idea that one's life itself confesses Christ through obedience to his will, Romans 6, 7, 18. That's where it comes right down to so much instruction in the New Testament about what you do in your daily activities that carries out the authority of the Lord. And we're back to really what's above my head up here. Whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him, Colossians 3, 17. That's all day long every day. Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. So we've seen how the word confession is used in God's great plan of salvation. We've seen how Christ saves us, but he does it through his plan of salvation. And that it's made up of component parts, and they logically fit. So we need to be mindful of that as we teach others. And even when at the end of sermons we give the plan of salvation, then we ought to make each step fit where God put it. So may our lives confess Christ, even as he witnessed, that is, Jesus witnessed a good confession, 1 Timothy 6.15. And as Paul compliments Timothy doing the same, and as all Jews had to do or be lost 
as Jesus said, except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now, how were they to make that known? They would confess it with the mouth and complete their obedience to the gospel and being baptized in order to be saved, Mark 16, 16. If you're a child of God and you sin, then there's a second law of pardon, and it involves confession, but not confession of your faith in Christ, but having repented of whatever sins that has separated you from God as a child of God, then you confess those sins to God. And if they brought reproach on the church, then you confess them as far as they were committed. If their secret sins known only to you and God, keep it that way and settle it that way according to God's pattern in his second law of pardon. Repentance, confession of sin, and prayer to God for forgiveness. But if you brought reproach on your brothers and sisters in the Lord by the way you're living, whatever that sin may be, publicly done, then come confessing it and asking your brethren to pray with you and for you for the forgiveness of those sins. The glad tidings is this. God wants to forgive. He stands ready to forgive. But it's all based upon our disposition of heart as it's guided, directed by the right and divided word.